uh, the power of data in shaping transforming culture. Um, I, I spend, and there's a teammate of mine here, Marla, we spend a lot of our time trying to crack this, this, this question, trying to crack this, um, this challenge. And I'm going to tell you my story of um, you know, what we've been doing over the last two years to try to do this. But first, um, I think that what I want to start off with is um, I work for a really, really interesting company, um, which the great majority of you will never have heard of, uh, GFG Alliance. Um, the, it, it's facing some really, really big challenges, um, and I'm hoping that data is going to play, data analytics is going to play a, an important role in helping us um, um, solve for these. So GFG is a, it's a portfolio of steel and aluminium businesses um, which are scattered across uh, 10 countries, mainly first world uh, or de developed countries, first world countries. Um, and that in and of itself is not particularly interesting. What's interesting about GFG and its story is the guy who owns it, a guy called Sanjeev Gupta. Now, you may not have heard about GFG, but some of you will have um, possibly inadvertently read about um, Sanjeev. Um, and he's, he's a genuine visionary. And what's interesting about Sanjeev is not just the assets he buys, but the, but the vision he has for transforming those assets. I kind of describe him as kind of the Richard Branson of the industrial space. Uh, because he, ha he has a genuine vision with, a, with real conviction, and he's placing some massive bets about trying to, you know, trying to deliver that, that vision. So the, um, what's the business model? It's, you know, I'll keep it really simple. Um, uh, he buys three types of businesses. He buys orphaned assets from the large global steel and aluminium businesses. Um, he buys uh, businesses, uh, these are steel and aluminium uh, manufacturing largely, but also production, um, that um, uh, are old, um, uh, underinvested and need reinvention. And he buys renewable energy businesses. And he's trying to combine those to um, not just transform these businesses, but actually transform the very industries in which he's operating, which is steel and aluminium. Um, now, you kind of need two ingredients. And again, keep it really simple. You need two ingredients to do this. You need uh, capital and financing to, to, to buy the businesses, to invest in the assets that we're purchasing. And you need people. Um, and the task around people is to, uh, to transform the very relationship that our employees have with our assets, with our operations, um, in order that they can tap into or release discretionary effort uh, to help them and help us, us help each other to transform these businesses. Um, and by the way, he's also trying to be the first steel and aluminium uh, manufacturer in the world to produce uh, carbon neutral products by uh, um, 2030. Um, I cannot overstress, this is a tall order, and frankly, the stakes could not be higher. Um, so, the stakes couldn't be higher because I just got my lines. <laughs> okay, so, um, um, I'm focused on the latter part of that equation, which is people, and, and putting it simply, I focus on people and culture uh, performance. I, I'm not, I, I am part of HR, but it's a discrete part of HR, which is really trying to focus on ways of um, capturing uh, performance and, and actually that performance flowing into the, into the business. Um, uh, technology, data, and data analytics is, is playing a really central role in that. Um, but it's targeting a, a rather unorthodox outcome. And that outcome is um, powering up people performance through self-determined change. Now, I'll, I'll talk to you a little bit about self-determination in a bit, but it's, it's not the typical target for, for data. So as will become uh, abundantly clear, I'm no data specialist. I would euphemistically describe myself as a um, uh, amateur data enthusiast. My long suffering colleagues would have far more colorful words to describe my interest in data and its application to our business. But the point here is this presentation isn't about uh, technology or the finer nuances of data, data analytics. It's, it's presenting my view um, on the central role that uh, uh, technology, data, and data analytics can, in our case, is trying to play in cracking what I think is actually one of the biggest challenges out there uh, for our organizations, whether it be corporate or otherwise, and their leaders, which is how to um, purposely shape culture um, at the individual level as well as at the meta level in a way that lifts performance both at scale and at speed. And that is a really big nut to crack. But I think data has a, a really critical role in, in, in doing so. Um, uh, the, the guts of my um, strategy when you boil it down is pretty uh, simple, at least in concept. Uh, practice is a different problem. 
um, it involves uh, using, um, uh, using technology uh, and data to um, support this notion of self-determined change or self-determination, uh, and in particular using data uh, to target and drive this self-determined change. And the um, uh, critical to the mission is exploring, uh, experimenting with different forms of technology, different forms of data and their application, um, uh, you know, in, in order to uh, create um, to, to create relevance, to create data that is relevant at the individual level, at the individual level's context, so your, your particular uh, you know, person in your role, in your team, that also aggregates um, and uh, is, can be interpreted at a meta level across, across different clusters. So think team, think business unit function, uh, Australia global. Um, that's the game. And I'm going to share you, with you in a, in, a, in a bit four stories that um, uh, are our attempts to do that. So um, let's start with, if this works, and it builds. OK. So um, let's start with uh, who, who GFG is. So GFG is Sanjeev Gupta, Gupta Family Groups of Companies. Um, the short version of the story is he's an Indian-born, Cambridge-educated uh, entrepreneur that started this business in his dorms at Cambridge 20-odd years ago, uh, where by the end of it, he was pumping out about a million quid per day and nearly got booted out of Cambridge because of that success. You're not supposed to have commercial endeavours at, at, um, at Cambridge. Um, he then spent the next 20 years building a commodities trading business uh, called Cymec. You've never heard of it. Uh, I hadn't heard of it. And then seven years ago, he does something really interesting. He takes this, you know, this cash that he's, this capital he's been accumulating, and he goes and buys uh, an industrial asset. And it was a small industrial asset in Wales, in Newport. It was a steel business that was flailing, and he, and he buys it. And that uh, was seven years ago. And over the ensuing seven years, he's turned that uh, business, which had 200 employees, uh, into uh, a semi-empire, which has over 30,000 and building. Right, so the, um, here are some stats, um, 30,000 employees, uh, we operate in uh, 10 countries, 200 sites, the eighth largest steel and aluminium manufacturer outside of, of China. It's huge. Now, I want to share with you a, a, a clip from um, uh, the Australian story, which did a, did a, um, a highlight on uh, Sanji's acquisition of what was then the Aryan business, which went into voluntary administration. So our most famous asset in Australia for good and bad reasons is the Wyala Steelworks in Wyala, South Australia, third large biggest regional town in South Australia, and there's only one game in town, and that's the, the Steelworks. So let's, let's have a quick listen to this. The slogan for Wyala always used to be, where the outback meets the sea. You've got the, the salt bush left and right. And all of a sudden, you see in the distance some smokestacks. And you think, that's rather strange, there's all these smokestacks in the middle of nowhere. And you get a bit closer again, and you come up against the steelworks. A steel plant that looked like it was born in a Charles Dickens novel, set in England in the 1850s. because I know what's actually going on in those big sheds. I know it's the heart and the soul of our town. It's the, the lifeline. It's in our blood, it's our, it's our heartbeat. If the steelworks closed, there would be no Wyala. There is no other industry in this town that hires that many people. We're a one company town. If the steelworks sneezes, Wyala catches a cold. And two years ago, the, the steelworks got a coronary. When Mr Gupta arrived here, I think the business community in Australia thought, this is a man who's arrived from another planet. For me, I found uh, what I regard as a, as a diamond in the rough. I would say that Waila is a town that saved itself. Okay, so the town that saved itself, not so fast. Um, we've owned it for uh, two and a half years. Over the last two and a half years, those steelworks have continued to hemorrhage losses, well publicised, hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, uh, as I said, the stakes could not be higher. Um, 
this is not the fault of uh, the steelworks, it's not the fault of GFG, it's not the fault of people who work there. It's a reality of a subscale steel manufacturing in a global market. Um, and until we transform that business, both the assets and the people, uh, it, it, will be in, it will be in peril. So the reason I'm sharing that little clip is it kind of gives you a real feel for our company. Uh, Wyala is a, it's a microcosm of GFG. Now, while the losses at Wyala are, are um, an outlier, thank goodness, um, that story is repeated across our, our, our business, right? The, these are the businesses that we buy and that we need to transform. As I said, the stakes could not be higher. Um, so not surprisingly, uh, change um, is pretty important to our story. Uh, transformation is probably a better term. These are the three values that we have. Uh, they're actually pretty unique. Uh, change is the first, it's the most important. These uh, corporate values are actually Sanji's values, literally. This is how we came up with them. Um, and uh, he, is, uh, he makes his decisions, he thinks strategically, everything goes through these filters. He is desperately um, wanting the businesses that he is buying, the people who work for G the GFG family to, to be active participants in change. So let's look at change. Um, uh, uh, change, let alone genuine transformation involving people in particular, is a very, very tricky business indeed. Um, and the statistics are compelling and confronting. Any attempts at change, particularly transformative change, which is banding around like, uh, like lollipops, uh, with people will have a probability of failure um, likely in the 70%, right? And that's just for typical change programs. So you lay on people and it goes up. So um, Kotler came out with his seminal piece, Leading Change, back in the, in the 90s. He came out with this headlining, head, headline grabbing statistics, 70% of change programs fail. Um, since then, 17 years later, 25,000 books, papers, and you know, YouTube uh, TED Talks have been uh, published on the topic of change. So McKinsey comes out with its offering last year, Beyond Performance 2.0 kind of an update of the Kotler um, uh, piece. And guess what? And if you can excuse the pun, nothing has changed, right? 70% of projects, projects and programs and pro uh, everything else has failed to deliver against their mandate. So um, let's spend a couple minutes just thinking about change and what works and, and why these statistics exist. So I'm going to share with you a, um, I wish I'd, I'd put this together, but I didn't, um, a very simple schema, but that I think gives us a really elegant clue as to what's going on with these failures. So we have the hard high land. This is the land of the logical leader where change initiatives are born, where they're discussed, where they're agreed, and when they're, where they're cascaded down through the layers of the leadership. Um, and then we actually have this thing called the swampy lowland. This is the messy land of where change actually takes place. So let's look at how it works. Um, information flows one way, top down. Um, people are listening. Um, they may, may not be acting. It's not necessarily because they're passive or compliant, but they're actually sense making. We then have people querying top down messages, uh, not because they disagree, they know, but actually that it's part of the sense making process. Trouble is our, our, our illustrious leaders are, uh, experience this questioning as um, questioning of the, of the project, resistance to it, if not downright impacting their own sense of identity. Um, what happens is alternative views are suppressed, right? Uh, I'm not gonna push back, I'll just talk, talk about this at the water cooler. Uh, fault lines of supporters and detractors um, uh, form and, and change projects crater, right? So another way of talking about the hard highland is the memo. Right? These memos are written all the time. They're spoken, they're written, they're emailed. Um, and it's, and it's kind of like this. People will review them, they will skim, they might even read them, but how many people actually deliver what that memo is saying? Right? Probably 30% if you believe McKinsey and Kotler. So this cycle is the reality of change in the swampy lowlands, right? This is how change actually takes place. Now, this very simple schema is the most well-researched body of theory, knowledge, and practice globally around change, behavior change in particular. Any program, book, um, motivational video, uh, YouTube clip that you've ever seen will be based on this model, right? And this is change in the swampy lowlands. Um, let me go back for a second. Um, we need to, for change to occur, uh, for this cycle to work, we need fuel, right? 
um, and that fuel putting simply is called motivation. Now we have two types of fuel. We have the uh, high lead polluting ineffective fuel of uh, extrinsic motivation, carrot and stick, right? Uh, and then we have the um, uh, green fuel, high octane, high performance fuel of intrinsic motivation. Um, intrinsic motivation is I want to do this, therefore I will. If I get a bonus, great, but I just want to do it, right? Intrinsic motivation. So you need fuel. Um, the, fortunately, there's another theory, and again, very well-researched body of knowledge theory and practice called self-determination theory. Very few people have heard of it, but again, intrinsic, this effectively coined the term intrinsic motivation. Two guys, Ryan and Decky, not Dan Pink, came up with this theory in the 90s, and it's a, it's a theory, it's a macro theory of human motivation and personality concerned with the motivation behind choices people make without external influence or interference. So now that you know what um, self-determination theory is, what the heck has this got to do with data, right? Everything, right? If you take one thing away from this presentation, data has everything to do with this picture. So let's have a look why. So we have our um, cycle of change in the swampy lowlands. Um, we have uh, the fuel of motivation. Well, that fuel needs ignition to work, right? And um, you know, most people in this room would look at this saying, then, oh, that's just a feedback loop, isn't it? 100% right, it's a feedback loop. And uh, feedback is the ignition for the fuel. So um, we have data all around us um, igniting fuel around operations, around commercial, around finance. But when it comes to people, the, uh, the typical feedback that has been igniting the fuel of motivation has been costly, um, uh, has been uh, non-real time, has been clunk clunky, and generally is ineffective, right? So let's think of um, uh, annual reviews, performance reviews, uh, annual eng engagement surveys, um, mentoring, uh, peer review and executive coaching. All of those have a place, they have some efficacy, but broadly speaking, I think they actually fail to deliver that feedback. Data is designed to do exactly this, right? So if we look at the, the new technology that's emerging, uh, the data that technology is producing around the way people work and act and, and play, uh, it, is, it is the DNA of the ignition that we need. And if you can apply that data to support self-determined change, you get super fuel. And if you get super fuel, you've got a shot at the title of changing. So if you can connect these um, individual feedback loops across different people, you get meta feedback loops uh, around clusters of teams, of BUs, of functions, et cetera, et cetera. You kind of see where the picture's going. So um, I'm going to share with you four stories of how we're trying to operationalize this. We have eight initiatives, all of which are um, uh, you know, uh, based on technology enabling data production uh, that supports self-determined change. Um, the first one. So the first challenge that we had, uh, and the biggest challenge we had uh, when I started a couple of years ago, was um, we had no idea how engaged our workforce was. We had, uh, not at that time, but we, we now have 30,000 people. The great majority of these have not been asked for some time, or in fact never been asked, whether they're engaged, how much they're engaged, what their experience is in the workforce. We, ha we were absolutely blind. So imperative number one, let's ask our people, um, you know, how they're, how they're going. Um, so I'll get to this in a second, but the, um, no, I'll get to that now. I'll get to that in a second. Um, uh, this is a trigger, trigger, right? So um, uh, employee engagement is, is central to performance around, uh, people performance at least. In fact, I actually reckon it's, it's ground zero. So what we wanted to do was find some technology that allowed us to pulse our employees cost effectively in a way that could really scale up and provide us data, not just about the engagement score, but would able, was able to, in a, in a sense, uh, use the power of technology to, to get a first-hand sense of the voice of our people. And for that voice to create a, uh, if you will, a massive mirror of what they're experiencing that our leaders could look into. Um, so we searched around, um, we, spent, we spent a lot of time looking at different vendors. Um, we, came, we came up with um, partnering with Pecon, who are not just our technology partners in this, they're, they're really strategic partners in this. They are really helping us inculcate this into our organization. And this is how it works. So we use um, EMPS, or you can just use an average. It uses a bunch of, it, it looks at drivers, motivational drivers, which by the way, are based on self-determination theory. So that was a tick in the box. You can cut the data any, any which way you want. 
Um, it, it most importantly gives us the ability to um, invite uh, freeform comments from our, um, from our business. Those comments get um, uh, sorted into topics. Um, and at, the, at this stage, we had 70,000 comments in the systems after I think it was three, three or four of these things. We have over 100,000 now, right? You need data to work through that 100,000 freeform comments. Um, it looks at, it maps against our values, et cetera, et cetera. It's a great tool. And we started, um, uh, two, uh, two years ago, or 18 months ago, with 200 pilot, we made it opt-in. If you don't want it, don't take it. And we just gave this opportunity to the business to say, do you want to hear from your people? And the great majority of the now 16,000 people we have on this have, in fact, all of them have opted in. Um, the, the, I guess the, there's, there's one thing that I want to leave with you, leave with you on this slide. We have um, great statistics, really proud of those statistics um, compared to Picon's you know, um, uh, client base. The point here is the statistics aren't because of PECON uh, or because of the tool or because of the data. It's how we're using the data. We go out of our way to say to our leaders, do not focus on your EMPS score. Do not focus on your engagement stats. Um, use this data to start a dialogue with your people, right? So it's not about the data. It's about the conversation that the data prompts. And that's the, uh, you know, I think the, um, the, the key thing here is that if you really want to um, engage with people, give them free form voice to say whatever they have to say without fear or fail failure and use that to um, promote dialogue, not KPIs. That's the point. Okay, the second um, challenge we had, um, critical to GFG's uh, business um, is continuous improvement and innovation. This is not just a nice corporate, you know, to have uh, or, a, or a thing that we like to advertise for the employee value proposition. Some of our business will, will live or die based on the continuous improvement processes that they have in place. So last year we bought seven uh, businesses from Aston Mattel in Europe, uh, 15,000 employees, and we wanted to signal to them in the first 100 days that their ideas mattered and we wanted to hear from them. Um, I cannot, if you go back to the video from the Australian story, that's the reality of these operations. The great majority of them have never been asked in their 30, 40, 50 years of working in these businesses, do you have an idea of how to improve it? Um, it's not saying, that's a, it's a terrible blanket statement, but that's broadly speaking the case. So we wanted to sing to them, we want your ideas. We wanted to do it quickly, we wanted to do it cost effectively, and we wanted to have some sort of efficacy, i.e. we wanted to actually have really good um, ideas that came out of it. The problem with um, typical corporate constructs, hierarchies, is that they tend to block, um, at, at best bottleneck, the flow of ideas across layers, not just from the top, across all the layers. And we wanted to cut through all of that in one fell swoop. So this is kind of how we had a crack at trying to do it. We partnered with a group called Crazy Might Work to democratise idea generation. We asked our 15,000 employees to put ideas in, and you create an idea by adding a fish. So here are the ideas, they all represent fishes. This is transparent, everyone gets to see it. People can feed the fish, to feed the idea if it's a great idea and the fish gets bigger. Um, but if, the, if ideas aren't fed, if they're not voted up the top, um, fish get eaten. And if you look at the shark, that fish is a bit, uh, boom, there he goes. So th the fish gets eaten. And, and we use this gamified, um, you know, very simple platform across seven countries, seven languages. We had something like, I think it was 500 ideas by the end of it. Yeah, I think this only says 300 here. But we had 500 ideas. Okay, not all those ideas were cracking, but a big chunk of them were right? And that cost us nothing. I mean, it cost us a bit, but really nothing. And we touched something like 8,000 employees um, with this tool across all of our businesses globally. Again, it's opt-in and we're getting our, our doors knocked down to, to do it. The, um, okay. So the, 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 the point here, oh, there's a screen down here. I didn't see it. Um, the, <laughs> the, the, the point here is that great ideas come from everywhere. You just need to ask people. Use technology to um, level the playing field, to democratise um, the flow of ideas. Great ideas can come from the CEO, right? That's what they're paid to do. But, you know, darn, they can come from the janitor, the cleaner, the, you know, the guy who's bending steel on the bar. But everyone has great ideas. Democratise it, empower it, tap the wisdom of the crowd. Okay, um, third challenge. Um, thank goodness um, uh, we, uh, we had the ONA lesson this morning. Um, so this is about ONA. Um, the problem we have is leader-led change is, uh, it is painfully slow and notoriously um, ineffective. Now, 
we want, and that's across, I would argue, all organisations. We want our leaders at GFG to lead the charge, to have the strategy, to cascade it down, but we can't just rely on that because we don't have the luxury. So we need to look at different ways of accelerating change and making change stickier. Um, we're looking to informal networks to do that. So informal networks have the prospect of um, increasing the speed of change, uh, making it much stickier, and actually making it, uh, it's, it's, it can be a huge incentive to, to um, what we call network leaders. And, and I think it was, uh, Melanie was um, you know, beautifully described that there's all these people out there that aren't quite high performers, but are actually performing uh, really well and are high performers. You just don't see it in the dark matter of the data that's not there. So in my view, ONA provides a spotlight um, on the dark matter that we just, um, we just assume away. So I'm just going to, you know, picture tells a thousand words. Wow, this is quick, this thing. Okay, so I'm going to, uh, picture tells a thousand words. Um, there's two teams here. Uh, they're teams that uh, both report up to a CEO of a large global um, uh, business that you'll probably know about. It's research data. It's obviously um, um, unattributable. The, 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 the two blue circles are the two network brokers on each team. Uh, the backstory to this is, is several years of trying to get these teams to come together. Again, CEO, direct report to the CEO, important teams, failed. Um, they looked at some data, they found there was a couple network brokers, nothing to do with positional power, it was simply how much information was flowing between them. They, they showed that the only intervention in this entire process was showing the network brokers in the first instance, but then the teams, this data. This is what happens over three months. So it's, it's, a, it's a, a time lapse uh, of live data over three months. Just check it out. So this is um, month one, month two coming up, and then month three. That's cool. Right? That's not just cool because it's cool technology and data and visualization. It is cool. But, um, it's cool because two years of traditional approaches to change management, to, to collaboration, this and collaboration, that, failed to deliver. The only intervention here was showing them the data, unattributable. That's amazing. Okay, so um, the power in formal networks is real. So there's, there's, uh, there's research that I've seen out of the um, Center for um, Collective Intelligence at MIT that has like years of operationalized research right in, in the field that says that um, using the power or harnessing the power of, in, uh, of informal networks can lead to change that's eight times faster than traditional approaches and far stickier. They are compelling statistics. So the, the message here is, um, you know, if you want to accelerate change, um, look to invest in, and frankly, look to explore and just have a crack at different forms of uh, technology that might be a bit sort of off the off piste, but have real promise, uh, rather than focusing all your time on the traditional hierarchy that we all focus on and rely upon for change. How am I going for time? Because I didn't have my stopwatch on. Three minutes? Okay, I'm going to skip the last one. That's a really cool story, Al. So I'm going to, but I'm going to skip it because I only have three minutes. Um, the, the story, I'm going to quickly mention it. We have um, 23,000 people. If you, if you look at the 1,000 people we have uh, working in the Steelworks, a community of 22,000, um, we need them to be active change agents in, the, um, uh, in, 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 in what we need to do to transform these uh, businesses. Um, we teamed up with a guy called Dave Snowden. Some of you may have heard of them. He's pretty famous for a, um, a framework called the Kinefin framework. He also has a piece of software called SenseMaker. Um, basically, you ask people to tell a story. Those, to those stories are self-plotted on a series of triangles that have three morally neutral nodes to them, so there is no right or wrong answer. The data is aggregated. It, become, it, it gets mapped um, below topographical maps. So this is a, just a simple representation. Here is where all the stories are. This is kind of where people's mindset is. There's some stories over here, same facts, different stories, different mindsets. That's a great story. And so the whole process is how do you move the narrative from um, less stories like this to more stories like that? And there's a, there's a process for doing that. But the process is pretty simple. Um, and that's if you go to that website, you'll actually see that up and live and running. The, the, um, the, the, the narrative here is uh, change is emergent, particularly culture change. Stop trying to control it. Stop trying to put it through linear processes and Gantt charts and change champions and workshops and sheep dipping. It doesn't work. 
it's emergent. So use technology and data to help um, actually embrace that emergent quality. So I'm going to leave you with two points in my last 60 seconds. Um, one is, um, um, look, it's, it's, a, uh, it's a challenge. Um, I think there is a massive untapped opportunity uh, in people and uh, people analytics and data um, in the in the multi-billion dollar human capital space. And from what I see, and I do a lot of, I spend a lot of my time looking for kind of um, what's out there. This industry has not even scratched the surface. So uh, it was interesting uh, listening to Heather. Very few people are ta you know are targeting this space. Uh, my challenge to you is, is train your crosshairs, either as a practitioner or as a vendor, train your crosshairs on this space. It is a massive market and uh, there is virgin land to be grabbed here. But it, it, you know, it requires, to your point, Heather, courage. Um, the second point I want to leave you with is, um, and, and so common theme of the, of, of, um, of the various uh, talks that I've listened to, um, you know, data, data alone does risk dehumanizing our organizations. Um, we, we need to harness the power of data, but not for data's sake, but for the sake of our people, right? Use data to empower our people to self-determine their future within the confines of the vision, the strategy that our leaders are out there t telling us about. For me, it's in Mala, it's Sanjeev Gupta. Um, uh, this is not uh, an easy or well-trodden path, but I actually, I actually fervently believe that it's a path worth, worth treading, and I suspect will play a critical role in the success or failure of uh, GFG's and Sanjeev's ability to turn vision into reality. Thanks for listening. <laughs>